Today, I'm going to continue a message that I preached a few weeks ago titled No Separation. This will be the second part of that message. And the first part of this message came from Psalm 27. It's an incredible psalm. It's a psalm that was penned by King David prior to the first temple being built, obviously, because his son built it after he passed away. David had an inner court or an inner room and a place called the Ten of Meeting. It was a place where he would cry out to the Lord of worship, calling out to him night and day. The scribes would write down his songs and his prayers and his worship to the Lord. And David would pen Psalm 27 with this mindset and understanding that no matter what happens in his life, no matter who comes against him, no matter what difficulty or trial he was facing, God was always for him, that he had nothing to be afraid of. Even if an army were encamped around him, which war is imminent for a Christian. Now, the victory's already been had because of the cross, but the devil still tries to come against you to get you to believe lies and doubt and fall into fear and worry and revert back to your old ways. It's just what the devil tries to do. But God has sealed the deal. He sealed the deal by his cross and by his blood, and hence, you are never condemned. You're always justified before him. Now, you're not justified in every action or decision that you make, right? But God trumps that decision and says, I've made you just and I've justified you because of my son and because of the blood. Now, King David did not have Jesus. So he tapped into something part-time that we were meant to walk in full-time. Same with Solomon. In fact, all the patriarchs, they would have insights and understanding, but not have a full-time dwelling with it being inhabited by the Holy Spirit and being full-time free of guilt and shame because of the cross. Now we have that because of Jesus and we have that because of the blood. And so David would say that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Why would we ever be afraid? The Lord's the stronghold of my life. Why would I ever worry? So that's my question to you. It's a question I've been asking a lot lately is what actually are you afraid of? What are you worried about? And is the Lord really the stronghold of your life? As I've grown older and experienced more hardship, difficulty, trials, and testing, I have discovered that God really, truly is the stronghold of my life, and I don't need to be afraid. The issue always comes in not the circumstance, but how I respond to the circumstance around me. So David would get some incredible revelation, and he'd say, look, It's difficult, it's hard, and an army's encamped around me, but they're actually gonna be the ones that stumble and fall. No weapon formed against me is gonna prosper, and every tongue that rises up against me in judgment, God's gonna condemn. The problem is, is I don't know if you really believe that. Now, I'm not here to just tickle your ears. I'm here to challenge you to walk out different and to be conformed. Now, to be conformed means I'm growing into something. I'm becoming something. And God predetermined or foreknew before the foundations of the world that you would be conformed to the image of his son. And so I'm going to give you the heartbeat of the essence of the gospel today, which should change a lot of things in your life. It should change the way that you feel right now, the way that you think, the way that you live, the way that you believe, the way that you defend yourself the way that you post on Facebook or not post, the way that you speak or don't speak, the way that you love your spouse, the way that you trust God for your future. What God did for you and who you become should radically change your life and cause you to be engaged instead of disengaged. Now, some of you have been going to church maybe way too long, heard too many messages, maybe heard me preach a lot of times, and in a lot of ways, it's just like, oh, another message about lordship and identity and sonship. But I know what I know by the Spirit because I know what I feel and see as the shepherd of this house. Some of you are disengaged, disconnected, frustrated, irritated, worried, depressed, nightmares, and kind of maybe don't really want to be here. But God keeps pulling you here. And if God keeps pulling you here, I'm gonna keep saying the same things. You are justified because of the blood. God is making you just. You are in the process of learning and growing and conforming. And we have grace and mercy and love you no matter how much you manifest. Not every church is gonna be that way. And we're not perfect either. 
as a church. We're growing and learning and discovering. But what I really want you to know is when God's the stronghold of your life, you have nothing to be afraid of. You have nothing to worry about. You have nothing to protect. You have nothing to preserve. So David would say that more than anything else, what he would want is the presence of God. It's to dwell in his house, to gaze upon his beauty. What does that mean? That means that I'm, I long more than anything to see him, to know what he's saying, to know what he's doing, and to not do anything outside of that. I don't want to say something or do something outside of what he says or does. And what I want more than anything is the presence of God around my life because it always brings comfort, strength, peace. And I've said, I said this last service, I'm going to say it again. If God appeared right now in front of you and said, ask me any one thing, what is it that you would want to know? Ask me any question. What would you ask him? What would you ask God if he stood right in front of you in person? I know what I would ask. I've thought about it a thousand times because it's the thing that matters more than anything. God, how do you really feel about me? Because I have to walk by faith right now and trust God's word and what he said in writing. He put it in writing. And I have to trust what I believe by the Holy Spirit. But when I'm face to face with him, what I long for more than anything is for him to wrap his arms around me and pull me close as the son and comfort me with his love and tell me personally, face to face, I don't want to know anything else. There's nothing else that matters. Because in this life, we always have to battle doubt, worry, fear. We wrestle against unbelief. We wrestle against the struggles of this life. We wrestle against other people. You know, I, the devil, he's the least of my concerns. Many times what bothers me more than anything is what other people do or what other people say. But then I realize I'm not actually fighting you. I'm not fighting a person. I'm fighting a master puppeteer. Right, right. His name's the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And so there's a lot of times that I get frustrated with what people do, but I learned a long time ago, most people won't, won't do what I think they should do. And so I need to learn that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is the king of his church. It's not my job to fix you. It's my job to love you and sometimes correct you, but it's always done out of love. So if correction's brought publicly or correction's brought personally, it always needs to be done out of love. And I, I will admit, sometimes I just want to slap somebody, but God's like, yeah, you're not going to do that. <laughs> and sometimes you want to say something you shouldn't say, but God says, no, zip it, you're not supposed to say that. Because I've called you to edify and build, not tear down. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will see God. And I want to see God now. I want to see peace in your life. I want to see you rested, trusting. I want to see you stop combusting. I want to see you allowing your flesh to lead the way and start letting the spirit to lead the way. I want to see you that when you screw up and mess up and combust, you learn to run to Jesus every single time because you're justified. Even when you sin and compromise and do something stupid, you're still justified in his eyes before him. Now that'll spin people out because they don't understand that. And they think, well, that's a license to sin. No, it's not. It's such perfect love that it, want, it brings you to a place where you truly understand, I'm so dead to that, I don't want it anymore because this is so much better. Yeah. Just try to go back to the way that it used to be. It doesn't work. It's not the same. It'll never be the same once you give your life to Jesus, ever. It may satisfy for a moment, but it's never going to be the way it was before. Because before I gave my life to Christ, I could have cared. I never, ever, ever had conviction. I never worried about getting busted, which is why I got busted. I was a dumb criminal. <laughs> Driving down the road in a 1984 Oldsmobile Tornado with eight ashtrays full of roaches, a big giant steal your face Grateful Dead sticker and a, and a big promote Greenpeace and Fatty Patrol sticker on my car. <laughs> big joint sticker, that's Fatty Patrol covered in tied eyes and red wrestling shoes with a Mexican poncho on, I was a moving target. <laughs> uh, 
Now, see, you, you have to learn today and understand why you're justified, why you're not condemned, and why the Lord is the stronghold of your life. You should be asking yourself those questions. Why did God tell David, seek my face? And David responded, your face I will seek. And can you now full time get in the face of God and always be in the face of God no matter what? Can you? Or do you allow lies and fear and orphan spirit and justificate, a lack of justification, fear, worry, condemnation, shame, depression, anxiety? All these lies come in to keep you separated from God. But there actually is no separation. It doesn't exist. This is a massive lie. And it's causing so many of you to not be true to who you're really called to be. See, ju the word justified is made righteous as you ought to be brought back to the original intent. That's why you have to be born again. And if you're not born again today, hit the, rate, hit the big red reset button, surrender your life and stop being so stubborn. What are you waiting for? I don't wanna stay the same. How could anybody wanna stay the same? I don't, I don't wanna be the guy I was yesterday. I don't wanna love her the same as I loved her yesterday. I wanna love her more. I want to be more like him than I was yesterday. But that requires repentance, which means to change the way you think. You've got to think different. So my job is to convince you to think different and for you to say yes and let the transformation happen. I can't transform you, but I can give you the truth and the word and feed you an incredible meal that says, if you'll just eat this, if you'll taste, you'll see that God is good. I only know God is good because of how many times I failed and over, had to overcome hardship. That every single time God carried me through. I never doubted and didn't believe that God was good, ever. Because he came to me as a loving father and rescued me out of my brokenness. So my whole life, I believed that God is good. You need to believe and know that God is good too. And that will happen through overcoming and being more than a conqueror through every trial. And when you get born again, you get God's perfect love. You get the love that's better than your mom and dad gave you when you were a baby. You get to be loved right. You get to be loved the way you were always supposed to be loved. Because in your best day, in my best day, I can't even give to my kids the way that God gives to them. My love pales in comparison to his love. So you get perfect love. And then you realize, or once you learn, nothing can separate you. And Paul's gonna give you, I'm gonna give you, but Paul gave you 17 things that could come against your life to try to separate you from God's love. And it's 17 things that encompass everything that today, I guarantee you, every one of us is walking in. But what we do with it is the issue. Life, death, nakedness, peril, war, the sword, martyrdom. David wrote Psalm 27 when an incredible, an incredible war of an army and adversity and hardship was encamped against him. And he said, my answer lies in his presence. My answer lies in his face. My answer lies in the fact that the Lord is the, my light and my salvation. He's the stronghold. So I have a stronghold now inside of me. I have a better strong man. You have a better strong man than a, any demon could ever be. You have the strongest of the strongest man. And because of that, we understand that it doesn't matter. I'll never be afraid. You should never be afraid. There's nothing you should fear but God. But we fear all kinds of stuff. We fear what other people think about us, what they're gonna say, what our image is. Do we fit in? Do they like me? Why didn't they do this? How come they did that? Why did they say this? Why didn't they say that? And then we start living in everybody else's world because of technology that no one else has had like we have today. So now I can get up on your business. Listen, I don't want to live in your house. <laughs> I don't want to put your kids to bed. I'm wore out with my own. I don't need to dwell inside your head. 
And the problem is, is if God's not your stronghold and you don't have his saving light burning inside of you, I'm gonna look at you and when I see you, what I'm gonna see is all your shortcomings. I'm gonna be measuring you up, sizing you up. What'd you do last night? What'd you do last week? Why aren't you doing this enough? That's my biggest battle is I'm feeling like I don't do enough. Last thing you need is somebody else to come and tell you that you're not. But when you have God's burning light and saving light inside of you, and he's the stronghold of your life, you'll see other people the way God sees them. Now I see you as a radiant, beautiful, on fire, powerful evangelist that if you open your mouth, people that would never give their life to Jesus through me or most of the people in here will do it because of you. Because now you use who you are and your beauty and your looks and your talents for God's purposes and God's plan. And now God brings you every promise you could ever ask for and everything you ever dreamed of are inside his heart. And now I start to declare that over you and I get you to believe and see the way God sees because I see it for me. If I can't see it, if you can't see it for you, how will you ever see it for someone else? So we're gonna continue on with the fact that there's no separation. And we're gonna start it out with Romans chapter eight, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Another way to say it is what is our response? How should we respond? What is our response? What's your response right now? My response is always thankful when it's painful because I've been through enough pain that I realize the best thing I can do at some point, you just kind of realize, man, I was the devil again, the lies of the enemy. I'm getting my hands, so I'm gonna thank God. I'm gonna thank God in every situation. I'm gonna give thanks in everything. So you sinned, you struggled, you did something you stupid, get your hands up and thank God, not for it, but in it. Because the only way out of it is through praise and thanks. But yet we come in, it's worship time, man. It's like, man, the two, Nathan's playing too long on the guitar, worship's too long. You know what? It could be 10 times longer for me if I had my way. I never want to get out. I love to worship. I love to linger. I love to sit in his presence. Come this Wednesday. This Wednesday is going to be a night of worship. It's going to rock your world. You always have two choices. Fear, worry, lies, shame, anger, hatred, depression, darkness, or trust God, get your hands up and know that he's good no matter what you're facing. Live, stay a Christian for any long period of time and you'll figure this out. Yeah. Don't give up. That's why I tell you, do not give up. And stay in a place that loves you and values you for who you are, not what you do. Yeah. So what's your response? What are you, what are you saying? Look at the scripture. What then shall we say to these things? Now, the question should be, what things? This is a rhetorical question. There's a whole bunch of rhetorical questions here, six of them in this section of chapter, in this section of ch chapter eight. Six rhetorical questions. But right now, we should be asking, what things? What should my response be to what things? Well, you'd have to read Romans 5 through 9 to really understand all the things the Apostle Paul's talking about. But I'm going to focus on a few scriptures to really help you understand the essence of the gospel and God's design and plan for your life. We got to go back to Romans 8, 28. Let's just go back a few verses. In Romans 28, it says that we know all things work. So God is always working. In all things, God is working on your behalf. All things. Now, you're, the question should be how and why. Paul gives the answer here in just a moment. He says, all things work together for the good. So every situation, actually, God has a design and a plan to work for your good. Why? Because he's good and he loves you. All things. You're going to learn one way or the other, but he's always good. Say it every week. You can choose to do it one of two ways. I'm choosing the easy way. 
And the easy way may not always feel easy, but it's much easier than the compromise and the lies and the fear and the shame and the combusting and the condemnation. So we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. So first you have to understand you're called. Called always goes first. God calls you by name. Matthew, Nicole, Tina, Jeremy, Robert, Layla. He first calls you by name. The grace of God comes to invade your life. He calls you by your name because he foreknew you. I'm gonna show you this in a minute. And then you respond. And when you respond and say yes, he justifies you in a second. Because you can't be just without his justice of what he did on the cross, and then his justice is on the inside. So you were once crooked, now he makes every crooked path straight. So no matter what you're facing, it's God's gonna actually work it out for your good. It wasn't a good situation that we lost a child, or hurricanes, or my mom died, or your family member died, or whatever it is. There's all kinds of, of hardships that come. Those situations in and of themselves are not good situations but God turned it out for the good based on your response and based on what Jesus did on the cross. It's always based on what Jesus did on the cross and how I choose to respond. So now I'm choosing to believe the words in writing instead of believing the lies of what anybody else thinks or says about me or about you. And every single day we have to fight against them. If you're an extrovert like me, silence is a killer. It's like, man, why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you call me? Why didn't you talk to me? Why didn't you tell me? And then we start to imagine things that don't exist. Whose purpose? His or yours? Somebody else's or God's? So this isn't about my purpose for you. I have a desire for you based on what I see God, but I have to now come into agreement with you. If we're not in agreement together through synergy, it's never gonna happen. You gotta get in agreement with God. So I can't force a purpose, God's purpose on you. It's God's purpose. Why are you living in anybody else's? Why are you living in someone else's purpose? This is such a religious, dysfunctional, I have a disdain for this thing. I hate this religious thing. It's always worried about if you fit in. I don't have to fit in. I'm a son of the king. I'm probably not gonna fit in. That's a better thing. So where did the fit in thing come? I'm the most not fit in guy. And the minute you try to make me fit in, maybe not more than Mark. Let's just say more. He might be number one. Or actually, maybe my wife. She's like, going to be true to herself no matter what. See, that's the thing is you're being true to God's purpose and true to yourself. You're stop worrying about what you don't have, what you wish you had, what somebody else thinks you should have, what everybody else has, which is covetousness, by the way. Why aren't I like that? How come they have that? I did all those things just as good as they did. Why are they having all those followers and more popular than me? Anybody? It's his purpose. So you're, you need to understand that all things are gonna work together for your good. Everything works together for your good because he's dad and dad knows what's best. <laughs> My little kids, well, I don't wanna do that. I don't care if you want to do that. I didn't ask you, do you want to do that? Why are we even having this discussion? We said, we, that's a common phrase in our house. <laughs> so everything's working together because you're called for a purpose. Verse 29, for whom he foreknew. Now watch this path. I'm just going to sum it up. I'm not going to break it all down. I'm just going to show you a path from start to finish. For new glorified. The better word for, than predestined is predetermined. 
God predetermined that you would become something. He foreknew before the foundations of the world that you would be sitting here at this moment right now hearing my voice. And God knows that he has a plan and a purpose. So first he called you. Well, the first thing is, is he predetermined you to conform to an image of his son. So what does God want more than anything? That you look and sound and act and talk and speak and love like Jesus does. So he's got a plan. He foreknew you're going to be like Jesus. If you say yes, if you said yes, I would imagine most of you did or you wouldn't be here. If you said yes, God knew that he was going to conform you to the image of his son. Now, conforming takes time. Some of you are on the long, long path. Like, holy cow, so stubborn. take some of y'all a little bit longer, but thank God he was super patient with me because it took me a long time. And I'm still a work in progress. I'm still being conformed. And so verse 30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. God made a decision. He foreknew. He called you. Then he justified you. And then he glorifies you. What does it mean to be glorified? To me, the best way that I could describe glorified is when David said in Psalm 27, one thing I desire is to dwell in the house of the Lord. It means that my house, my life is now the house of the Lord and I act, love, think, speak, walk, talk the way he does. Now that may be too super spiritual for some, but I don't care. It doesn't mean I use weird religious lingo all the time and I'm so heavenly good, I'm no earthly good. What it means is now I'm walking in the essence and the presence and the character and the nature of Christ. This is the design and the plan. Now I'm spirit-led, so when I walk in the spirit, I won't fulfill the desires of the flesh which are still there, even though I'm dead to it. It's dead. It's a stupid thing. It's futile. It's already dead. Even if I give it something or feed it something in a moment of frustration or desire for pleasure, it's still dead and I'm still justified yeah. before God. Good. Don't let religion steal this gospel lie out of you. I'm sorry, gospel truth out of you. <laughs> it's gospel truth. Right. Yes. Yeah, you're gonna have moments, you're gonna cry, you're gonna have hardships. Sometimes you're gonna feel overwhelmed. Come here, let me give you a big hug. Let me pray for you. Let me love you. Let me remind you who you are and who you're not. Let me remind you the words in writing. Let me re remind you by faith, by the Spirit. Let some power come into your life. Feel God's presence. Get your hands up. It's a Holy Ghost stick up. Don't come in here downcast, sitting around, sidetracked on your phone. You got your phone 22 hours of the day except when you're sleeping. And even then, some of you got it on by your head. And you come into worship, it's like, oh, phone, food, this, that, distracted from the main thing. Can't even tarry an hour a day in God's presence. God's what matters the most. What you value the most is what you get the most of. So now we need to understand what does it mean that we are justified. Now, many of you don't know what just, we just taught this in my class, but many of you don't know and understand what it means to be justified. First off, in the root word of justified is just. So God, now, when you were in just, using other people for your gain or spitting out in shame and victim mentality, fear, worry, doubt, addiction, whatever it is, any unjust way, because sin never just affects you. It always affects somebody else, okay? Now, you're dead to that. Jesus dealt with that, but now you have to learn and understand that you're dead to it, and God removes the desire out of you in the process of becoming like him. And so we need to understand that justified means God makes you who you ought to be, and he now makes you just. And now I demonstrate what has happened through my life. I've been set free. I'm innocent. This is what happens between you and the Lord. Now, for justice-minded people, the first thing you go to is, well, 
You're just telling people they got a license to sin. No, I'm not. I'm telling you the answer to sin. You got to get this. I can beat you over the head with the Bible or tell you how jacked up you are all the time. And some of y'all are jacked up, but there's a lot of grace and mercy and kindness and process because of the cross. You can't do one thing without Jesus and what he did. So justify, say I'm justified. justified. Now, some of you guys have a real hard time saying that because the devil comes along and tells you, oh yeah, you're not justified. Look at what you did. I said, I'm not looking at what I did. I'm looking at what he did. Let me solidify this for you a little bit more. Romans chapter five, verse nine. Romans chapter five, verse nine makes it very clear that we have now been justified by what? The blood of Jesus. So now you're saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, we were all once an enemy of God. I I never thought to myself, I hate God, but the actions of my life showed that I was an enemy of God. You see that? Every one of us was once an enemy of God. Don't think you were ever that good that you weren't an enemy of God. Now, some were worse than you, but all of us at one time were an enemy of God. So now we're reconciled, how? Through the death of his son. And now even much more have been reconciled, you're saved through his life. Salvation is then, today, tomorrow. It's an ongoing process. You are an ongoing process. Just get in the process and stop getting out. And when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you've got to learn to be obedient or you're going to stay in this cycle repeatedly. I counsel people all the time, same cycle. You you got broken pickers. Your picker's broken. Just picking wrong guys and girls repeatedly. Same cycle. And so now you're saved through his life and you're justified only by his blood. You're justified by his blood. So let's go back to verse 31, Romans 8, 31. What is your response to these things? If God is for you, no one can be against you. But will people make attempts to be against you? Oh gosh, they're gonna lie about you. They're going to call you crazy Jesus freak. So you get a little churchgoer now. Oh, you all about Jesus? We'll just give it time. You'll give up. Oh, look at you now. Oh, you call yourself a Christian? Ha! I knew it was awful. You're such a hypocrite. It's just a crutch. It's not going to last. Oh, I've heard all these lies. I know these real well, real well. But see, it doesn't matter who comes against me. Their plans shouldn't succeed. Lots of people will come against you, but are their plans succeeding? You, you got to ask yourself this thing. Are the plans of the enemy succeeding? The devil's always coming against you, but so what? He's defeated. That's a stupid lie. It's not true anymore. I'm not condemned. No, I'm justified. I've been called. Now I have confidence. Now nothing can separate. This whole essence of this block of scripture is nothing can separate me from God's perfect love. Hence, you don't stand a chance. You don't stand a chance, not because of what you're doing, but because of my response to the test that you're trying to put me through. It's all a test. Can you love better? Can you trust more? Yeah. Can you believe what God has said? If you can, then God will pull you out of it every single time. So their plans don't succeed unless we allow them to. This is based on your response and God's sovereign protection over his life. All adversaries are powerless based on what Jesus has done for you. Every adversary is powerless. It's under your feet. Verse 32, Romans 8, 32. This is another rhetorical question. Why wouldn't God freely give us all things based on what Jesus did for us? And better yet, what Jesus did, what God did for Jesus, and better yet, what Jesus did for you. So look at the scripture. He didn't even spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, all y'all, and he shall not, how shall he not with him also freely give you all things? Rhetorical question. 
you're freely given all things. Here it is. Now, in my mind, if I was in charge, I'd be like, oh, you can't handle that. You're not ready for that. God says, no, it's there. You just don't know it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grow you. I'm gonna conform you. I'm gonna teach you. I'm gonna train you. I'm gonna equip you. But the minute you give your life to Jesus and you surrender all, God instantly freely gives you all things. Now, you don't know what all you have. So what God does is he raises up preachers and people just like you to go tell the world, to herald the good news. Go tell it on the mountain today. You can't just come to church and hear a nice, good message, leave the same and not do something with what God has given you. I can't. Every time God shows me something, there's a requirement to do something with it. But I first have to do it out of peace and love and rest. Otherwise, I'm doing it out of religious duty and obligation. So why wouldn't God freely give us all things if he didn't spare his only son? Jesus is the answer. It's because of Jesus. It's only because of him. Verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Okay, you can try to charge me, talk bad about me, lie about me, whatever. It doesn't matter. God, you can bring a charge all day long. People will bring a charge. This is a good legal term, but guess what? I have a supreme court king, judge, that overrides every created thing. He's immortal. He's not, there's, he doesn't die. And so now because of that, you bring a charge. Now I want you to notice the process here. Who can bring a charge? It's God who justifies. Next verse. Who is it that condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore also has risen, who is even at the right hand of God making intercession for you. So now, not only did he die, not only am I justified because of the blood, now you can't even bring a charge against me. What happens? You can't condemn me because of what Jesus did. And he's actually got me on his mind full time. You're on his mind full time. You are on Jesus's mind full time, full time, full time, full time. There's never a moment, oh man, I, ah, gosh, I totally forgot about you. I dropped the ball. <laughs> it's silly to even think about. But our so little minute minuscule understanding of the goodness of God causes us to doubt and believe just how big he really is. It's like, oh man, he's never gonna fix my spouse, never gonna fix my kids, never gonna fix my finances. It's fear, 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 fear. Worry, 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 worry. Doubt, 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 doubt. And it all leads to self-preservation. Hide, fear, cover it up. He's always interceding. Interceding means I'm standing in the gap. So you got any gaps in your life? Oh, yeah, I got a lot of gaps in my life. Guess what? Every gap in your life, Jesus is praying for. Man, that should, that should make you so confident. But we, we got these like, just belief systems that are causing us to be weighted down and afraid and fearful and worried and robbing our sleep and our time with our kids and our pre- being present in the moment. And we're always thinking about tomorrow and we're never fully rested in the now. I don't want my life to race by. And I look back and go, man, I wish I would've. You know what I value more than anything is not stuff and money, it's my family and the kingdom of God and God's family. Those are my top three priorities. And God says, oh man, I'll give you more because you got the main thing, the main thing, son. And I hear the Lord say, you're my main thing. He's your main thing. Say, oh, no, 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 God's got to be way more concerned about the refugees in Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria. Not little old me in America. In America. (laughs) I'm going to segue real quick to say this. Y'all better be prepared for what's coming. 
I taught a message earlier this year about the wisdom of preparation. I'd go back and listen to it all. Mentally, physically, spiritually, be prepared in the natural, but more importantly, be prepared in the spirit. And don't walk in fear about what's coming down the line. Some of you are way more concerned about Joe Biden than Jesus Christ. You know more about what the president's doing than what Jesus is doing. I kind of don't care anymore because I'm not of this world. We're more concerned about the news and what's happening around the world and the new COVID variant. Oh gosh, here we go again. I'm like, been there, done that. I'm going to walk even stronger this time and we will, they'll have to arrest me if they think I'm shutting down, ever. Look at verse 33 again. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. So he's alive. He's praying. He's standing on your behalf. Verse 35. So what's going to separate you from the love of God? Another rhetorical question. If God foreknew me, called me, justified me, glorifies me, if God had a predetermined plan and Jesus paid the price already, what would I ever, ever be afraid of? Now, this doesn't mean trouble doesn't come before me and struggles and challenges and I have to fight against them. I'm not immune to the trouble of this world. It, again, I'm going to keep reiterating to you over and over again. It all comes down to what Jesus did and your response yes. to what Jesus did. Jesus. And it doesn't mean I don't weep and cry. It doesn't mean I don't travail. It doesn't mean I don't get on my knees. It doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean I won't, you won't be rejected. It doesn't mean that there's not difficulties and challenges. But now you start to get more resilient and you become a stalwart. A stalwart means I'm unshakable and immovable through all trials and tribulation. Now, I know this through lots of hardship, but you're, some of you are going through it right now or will go through it. So learn right now to stand the test of time and trust God and get your hands up. Get in the secret place. Worship God. Trust him like you've never trusted him before. So because of all those things, let me paraphrase him again. No one can oppose you. No one can charge you. No one can condemn you in your personal relation with God. Then you should know that should lead to this final point. What then can separate you from the love of God? Now there's seven things listed here. There'll be 10 more in a few scriptures from now, 17 things. These are 17 things that we're probably all gonna go through or have gone through at some point. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. You know, Paul wrote this in the days of of Emperor Nero, one of the most wicked Roman emperors that ever existed, burned Christians alive at the stake. He was a complete narcissist, a liar, a schemer, a scammer, a tyrannical ruler who killed his mother and his own siblings. The guy had a power trip. He was gay. He was jacked up. He killed his first wife by kicking her and killing her baby. It was bad. You don't even want to know the stuff this guy did. So then he's like, man, I want to build a golden palace. Let's burn down the market square. Oh, and then let's blame it on the Christians. And then we'll burn them alive at the stake or we'll cut their head off. That's when this was written. Actually, it was written six years before. This is about AD 40, AD, let's see, AD 58, 59, and AD 65. You can research this. Emperor Nero, you had the fire, and then he kills Christians at the stake. And then God steps in, and Emperor Nero commits suicide. And where are all those martyrs now? The, go read Ro, uh, Revelation 5. They're sitting under the, under the throne saying, God, when? When are you going to have... Bring justice, not for you to know, son. It's not for you to know, daughter, but I will have the ultimate justice. So, man, I don't want to die. Listen, 
Jesus said, some of you will die for my name's sake. It's protect, what are you protecting and preserving? I just want to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, so I'm not going to lose heart. Psalm 27, verse 14, unless I had believed, I would have lost heart. Or I would have lost heart unless I had believed I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. But if my life ends, I want it to end for the king of kings. And it's not even an end. It's just a beginning. I'll see you on the other side. Let's roll. And you cry, but you better celebrate and have a memorial. And if you guys, if any of you come to my memorial and you don't worship, I'm going to be upset from heaven. (laughs) Oh, there won't be anger there. I, I guess I can't be angry in heaven. You know what I'll be doing? I'll be interceding saying, get him, God, get him. Right there, see that one? Sitting down in their seat with that gloomy look? Get that one, God. (laughs) I'm almost done. I want you to really see that because of God's design and plan and the gospel of the cross, this is such a gospel message. This is good news in a world of horrible news, in a world of even bad decisions that you've made. While you were an enemy of God, he came and pulled you out and rescued you. Did he stop? Is he ever stopping? He's always interceding and seated at the right hand of God. The Lord said to my Lord, have a seat. Prop your feet up while I make your enemies a footstool. And we're all flipped out and spun out and divided and complaining and gossiping and angry and frustrated. It's not the life God's called us to live. And I understand it's tough. I wrestle with sickness. You all know that. I've been through massive adversity. Every night I go to bed contemplating this church and all the stuff that God's doing and my leaders and the people. And it, if I'm not careful, it'll spin me out with worry and fear and stress and doubt and anxiety. I can only do what I do because of the cross. You can only do what you do because of what Jesus did. So verse 36. Well, 35 again. What can separate tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword? Verse 36, as it's written, for your sake we're killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. To understand this, you've got to understand 2 Corinthians 4.11. 2 Corinthians 4.11, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. It's for Jesus' sake that you're delivered to death that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in your mortal flesh. You're mortal, he's immortal. Now you need the immortal God manifested in your life. So it's time to die. It's time to move to where it's not about you and your life and your purpose and plan, but his purpose and plan, and now you're in agreement with him. All of us are gonna be lied about and delivered to death. It doesn't matter who can charge you, who can come against you. In verse 38. For I am persuaded. Well, actually, verse 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? It means I didn't just overcome something. I crushed it because Jesus crushed it. Now I have the love of God. I just overcome financial hardship or poverty, or I didn't just overcome addiction I mean, people can do that through behavior modification. But now I smashed it once and for all. It's dead, it's done, it's gone for. I'm beyond a conqueror because of Jesus. Now I have the love of God and I did it his way, not my way. And back to verse 38, for I am persuaded. My final question to you is, are you persuaded? I'm persuaded. I'm once and for all persuaded that neither death or life, 
angels, principalities or powers, things present, or here's a really big one, things to come. Not nothing, no height, no depth. And I really like this, no other created thing because God has created everything. So why would the created think it could ever trump the uncreated? Why would a mortal thing ever be able to defeat an immortal God that's in you? What in the world's happening? If we don't get the true essence of the gospel message in our hearts and lives going forward and realize that nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, then you're gonna be moved and shaken consistently. You're gonna face trouble and hardship, but Jesus is your hope and your strength. You have the cross. You're gonna face things that are hard and dangerous, but our security in God is absolute. It's absolute. And I'll leave you with Psalm 118, verse six. The Lord is on my side. The Lord is on my side. The Lord is on your side. Let's say it together. The Lord is on my side. side. Period. The devil's mess with the wrong person. The, those charges, what charge? Oh, condemnation? Huh? No, you should feel bad when you do things that you do, but what you do with that feeling is you take it to God with godly sorrow and you repent and then you're saved. Yes, yes, yes. I repented for that. I hate that thing that I did. I hate it, but I repented. And now I'm saved from it because I'm not condemned. So go ahead, devil, and try to charge me with something that's already been covered under the blood. It's not going to work. When you get this, you will walk in complete freedom for the rest of your life. (sighs) Nothing can separate you. Oh, man, if you knew, Pastor, I was doing, I probably know. I don't really want to know, but man. Us, I'm not going to charge you. But we sure charge each other, don't we? This is to forgive them for they know not what they do. It's like, oh man, you knew exactly what you were doing when you did that thing. No, you actually didn't. Because if you really knew the truth, you wouldn't have done it. You were in deception. The faster you can acknowledge your deception is the faster that you'll be free. It doesn't give you a pass for what you did. It just helps you to forgive yourself quicker. Wrote that a year and a half ago in my encounter. The Lord is on my side. The Lord is on your side. In every, he's always thinking about you. He's always thinking about your finances. He knows what you can handle. He knows exactly what he wants for you. We just got to get with his plan and program and do it his way, not our way. One more time, say, the Lord's on my side. So what we're going to do now is we want to pray for you probably the most important time of the service. Here's why. The Bible says in Matthew 18 that where two or more come together as to touching anything that they agree upon in Christ, they'll have what they ask for. There's something in the power of agreement together. We, my wife and I can't walk together. Jeremy and I can't walk together. Lauren and I can't walk together if we're not in agreement. But the devil's going to do all he can to get us divided. So instead, what we're going to do is get closer We're going to invade spaces. We're going to pray. We're going to trust God. And we're not going to, we're going to make the choice to not go it alone. Don't go it alone. You're not alone. You're not the only one. But isn't that just the lie of the enemy to get you to think no one cares and you're all by yourself in your struggle? And in those midnight hours and those evenings when no one actually is there physically. But guess what? Think it not strange, the trials that have come to try you. Don't let it build a habitation in your mind. We all struggle. We all wrestle. We all have to fight the same fight. I didn't get any extra measure of grace than you did. And if you said yes to Jesus, you and I have the same Jesus inside of us. 
I may be a little ahead of you because I've applied myself to learn, but if you'll apply yourself, you'll actually learn more than I will learn. You'll outrun me. You're gonna have to outrun me. Yes. I'm decreasing. Yes. Once you hit 50, it's all downhill from there. Uh, that was all good preaching until I said that. Man, it all went downhill, didn't it? No, you understand what I'm saying is that in time we fade away and a new generation comes behind. I'm not decreasing my abilities and my capacities. Maybe in some areas I am. I'm not as strong as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. But what I'm saying is, is that some of y'all are... Uh, my, your kids are going to outrun you. Yes. There's gen, you got to think generations. Yes. Legacy, that's right. So grab a hold of it. Believe who you are. Walk in confidence and go tell somebody the good news. This is the essence of the gospel. How would God, who didn't even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, not freely give you all things? You're not condemned. Say, I'm not condemned. I'm justified. So here's what we want to do. I'm going to call the prayer partners up here in a moment. We're going to pray for you. The prayer component is very important. I'm not trying to just get a bunch of people to come up to the front. I know as the pastor, I get testimonies every week that when, you came, when somebody came up for prayer, something happened. Okay? Because some people don't really like their space being invaded, Aww. right? I love this. But God's a space invader. Just get around me, I'll give you a big hug. <laughs> and it'll be awkward. It might be awkward, but we'll, in fact, if it's awkward, we'll do it for all the world to see on camera. How's that sound? We just did. Yeah. So I love you. If you're hurting today, you're sick. We're, we believe in the supernatural. Yeah. The presence of God's here. We, we're not shrinking back. If you got pain, if you've been struggling in, the, in your head, spinning out, worried, divided, marriage problems, feeling separated from God, there is no separation. Yes. There is no separation. There is no separation. There is no separation. The Word of God is on your mouth and your lips and in your heart. The word of faith says this, Romans chapter 9, right here. So, my God, so far away. No, I'm actually right there. Well, God, I'm not hearing you. So, well, seek me out more. Spend time with me. You want the easy way from a podcast. <laughs> God, just give me your podcast, Lord. Just give me your podcast. <laughs> I need another book, God. I need another book. It's like, man, no, you need. Jesus. <laughs> Let's all stand. Let me have the prayer partners come up to the front. All my elders, team leaders, Mark, get up here. You're going to pray for some people. Jeremy, all my team leaders. I want my team leaders up to the front. I want all my prayer partners up here. Listen, I don't care where you've been, what you did. If you don't get that, I don't know what to tell you. I've been preaching this message for a long time. Stop condemning yourself. I can tell some of y'all are condemning yourself. Stop condemning yourself. And say yes. Be obedient to what God tells you. Okay? Uh, get off the crazy train. Stop living in compromise. You can do it. But don't live in condemnation. Okay? So today, if you need prayer for anything, and you felt separated, distant, hurting, broken, if you just blew it up with compromise. Come on up here and let somebody pray with you. Per nothing can separate you from God's perfect love, all right? Nothing can separate. If you feel separated, that's a lie. That's a lie. So I'm going to pray for you publicly. And while I'm praying for you, make your way up to the front. We have an awesome, awesome army of prayer partners. They prophesy. They speak life. They comfort. They got power. They've got authority. They're approved in this house to break some strongholds. And if you got some strongholds that's not the Lord, get it broken. 
And if you're not born again or you backslidden, come up and repent and let somebody pray with you, all right? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this church. Thank you, God, for our families. Thank you, Lord, that in every situation we fight, we fight right with you, Lord. Lord, we hang on to the promise of the cross, justified by the blood. Lord, forgive us for allowing fears and lies and worries and doubts and manifesting and combusting. Thank you, God, for your kindness and your mercy in our life. And everybody here that's been battling addiction and hurt and pain, God, let them see you, what you did and that you foreknew them, God. You predetermined that they would be your sons and daughters, Lord. This is your family, God. This is your house. This is your church. So have your way, Lord. Build our house, God. Build this house. And watch over our city and our nation. Because if you're not doing it, we're wasting our time. Have your way, Lord in our homes and our hearts. And everyone as they come to pray today, start making your way up if you guys want prayer. If you need prayer today, listen to the Holy Spirit. Okay, don't pull back. Don't pull back, lean in. If God's prompting your heart, I want you to come up and let somebody pray for you. And I thank you, God, for your power, your presence, your love and your life. And I thank you, Jesus, that it, Lord, as we go, we go stronger and better than when we came. Stronger and better than when you walked in today. I bless everyone, Lord, as they go. Watch over them face shine upon them hedge them in and keep them in the shadow of your wing in the night seasons and the hard times Lord may they never forget what you've done and who they are in you in Jesus name